time. All right, so here's how we're going to do it. And what I want to do is very specific questions uh, because I want to give as many people a chance to ask questions. Address them specifically to the individual or individuals that you would like to have a ask. So I'm going to go with you that I had to interrupt. Go ahead, and then I'm going to come back to you. I have a few quick bullet points and then a question. I hate those. <laughs> no statements. Go. When I was in college, I had Dr. Diamond, who was a yeah. ardent gold standard uh, advocate. The problem is there's not enough gold in the Fort Knox to be able to do anything <clears throat> with that. Okay? You may not agree, but as you're shaking your head. Second, with regard to Latin America, the Caudillos from Spain were the ones that influenced the, the, the mental uh, attitude of the people within Latin America, basically. The, there are books on this, and they will not, uh, this is why they have so many constitutions. Each person has their own personality they want to inject into the, into the situation. Uh, I'm going to go back to the, to the question of poverty. There'd be no, there, there's no capitalism unless there's religious freedom. And that hasn't been discussed here at all tonight. That is essential. I mean, if you don't discuss anything else, even with Anne Rand, she covers that. So my question now is, and let me mention on the religious thing. I met a Cuban refugee. When he came over here, he had no concept of Christianity. That is true in many cases. I don't know whether it applies at all. But he didn't understand the Bible. He didn't understand religion because they didn't have it practiced down there in Cuba. My question to you is, you're talking about poverty, trying to bring people up and influence their changes. The problem is that they live under a multitude of cultures and they have different mindsets. And there's really no one standard that you can use to, at least as far as I'm concerned, maybe you have a different opinion in terms of influencing people so they change their attitudes, in this case, towards capitalism. I have a problem today even with people who argue politically with me. They are ardent in their own framework. There's no way of changing them because they have so, such a, a focus uh, on poverty. So my, what would you do in this case? Let who, me. Who's your question to? The whole panel? No, no. It's really for Jaroslav. Jaroslav, okay. Because he was discussing it. Yeah, very good point. Very good question. Um, the first is about gold standard, which is easy. Uh, there's definitely a misconception of the quality of volumes of <coughs> gold in circulation or in the world and the inability to introduce gold standard. It's absolutely has nothing to do with reality. It doesn't matter how much gold it is. It's the uh, gold as the objective standard or good for uh, money, for means of exchange. And mid Mises... Hayek, many other uh, well-known economists wrote specifically about that, and uh, that's good that, for example, Cato Institute initiated the debate of how to technically can we move from where we are with fiduciary money to gold standard money. And your point is, like, we don't have enough gold. It's not just, you know, we cannot dwell on that too long right now, but you really want to do that, I can send you a lot of links or just extensively can ex explain why it's not relevant. Uh, when we talk about capitalism, I define that very simply. Capitalism has to have three basic things. Political rights, civic liberties, and economic liberty, economic freedom. And definitely religious rights are part of civic liberties. And that is uh, indispensable. So religious liberties are there when a person chooses to be, to go to church, that's his choice. Christianity says a set of values of its own kind. Uh, it has a different set from Ayn Rand, what Ayn Rand said. But if we really want to be, to quarrel, not to make friendships, right, to not to uh, form partnerships, uh, for change, like against Castro, against uh, Lukashenko, Putin, then we can sit here, okay, you are for religion, uh, I am for objectivism, we, we never work together. I am from a Catholic family. Uh, so, in the Soviet Union, going to church was like a challenge to the regime. Uh, I was a pioneer and Komsomol member because that, well, that was part of the whole system. It, uh, communists, 
set uh, guards in front of churches and uh, wrote everybody who went to church because they didn't want us to be there to listen to an alternative s mindset. Uh, for us, going to church was like a challenge to communism. And now I respect my mother. She's a Catholic. She did not. Re she refused a job. Uh, she refused a promotion because she said, "Well, my parents went to church, and I will go to church. I respect my parents. That's what my moral creed is." And I cannot criticize her for that because theoretically, when you go uh, to this kind of argument, that to mysticism versus reason, you come to the point that the duty. Uh, for me, for me to live. That's not my duty to help my mother. That's my absolutely egoistic and ultimate uh, need. I would be a miserable person. I would be a jerk if I don't help my parents. That's uh, that's out of the question. So the, we can just talking about the uh, very deep moral philosophical things. But what is going on in Russia today and in Belarus is that Russian Orthodox Church is becoming one of the most powerful corporations that deal with alcohol, with cigarettes, with car trade, with money, with land markets. And they in full endorse Putin, they fully endorse Lukashenko dictators, right? So, uh, and many people now argue what kind of religion and belief it is that is not about God, that's about serving the state. So uh, I wouldn't say that, well, this is something that we should ultimately concentrate our efforts on. But we should keep in mind that in many cases, like in the Soviet Union and the collapse of the Soviet Union and the role of John Pope II into the collapse of the Soviet Union <coughs> and the Soviet system was absolutely valuable and unparalleled. And that is why Poland was one of the first ones to, uh, to, to free itself from, from, uh, from uh, communism. But at the same time, when you talk about uh, the ultimate uh, value, which is life, for uh, Ayn Rand's perception, right, Ayn Rand's philosophy, there's nothing in uh, uh, religion that would contradict that. So for me, uh, I would not argue with staunch Catholicism or, or believers in my country, because I understand that our enemies are much more powerful, and they are ruthless, and they want to uh, essentially take our lives, while it is a voluntary choice for me to go to church every week, or every month, or once a year. So that that's uh, religious, I deliberately did not uh, talk about religious in my present, religion in my presentation, but Please be sure that capitalism cannot be like full-fledged with the, with restrictions of religious rights. But competition of religion is absolutely normal. While in Russia and Belarus we don't have it, we have Russian Orthodox Church that says this is my territory. You Catholics, don't you dare get into there. You Protestants, don't you dare get there. And that's reality which is definitely contrary to the pr principle of voluntary uh, take, uh, voluntary accept acceptance of a certain moral code of beliefs. <coughs> and finally, poverty. Uh, I don't think that that's a good idea, for example, to empower uh, religion or, or church, right, in an authoritarian country to raise poverty. Because you look at... Uh, Again, our countries, because I know how it is. You have uh, uh, priests riding Mercedes 500s, living very fancy life, and you, at the same time you have poverty which is growing, and these guys, priests, who uh, drive very fancy cars, they don't have any restrictions in going anywhere, even to Bahamas to have a, a vacation. They, they, uh, support the governments that made this poverty. And many Russians now are against religion, against the church, I would say, right? Not against God. Because they believe that's a sinful behavior. Because how could you possibly live as a czar? Like, do you know that Putin, for example, built a, 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 a residence for himself which is worth $1 billion? And, the, and he's got Kirill, 
who's got like uh, the the uh, the rank of colonel of KGB at the top of Russian Orthodox Church. <coughs> These are the issues that uh, they are complex issues. But again, we we should just be open and clear of uh, stating the truth and do not vilify Ayn Rand because of her ethics. Because, like, uh, give me one example. In America, there was an opinion poll among uh, Catholic Americans about a very sensitive issue of contraception. So you know that Catholic well, religion is definitely against contraception, right? 95% of Americans violate this. 95%. That means that, well, you've got, you go to, uh, to confession, uh, you talk to your priest, well, so uh, I sin, well, the next, you go out of the church and you do it again. So I think that uh, the, the Catholic Church, uh, Russian Orthodox Church, have a lot of big issues around. And we, as uh, we they belong to the church or we do not belong to the church, we should discuss them in a friendly, open manner. What is missing sometimes in, uh, in my colleagues, libertarians in America, is uh, the friendly manner, polite manner, diplomatic way of explaining things, tolerance. What I hear is a lot of Bolshevism. Bolshevism doesn't work. Whatever your creed is, you have to be tolerant, you have to be patient, you have to understand that people sometimes face these ideas for the first time. And some, they believe that these ideas are in conflict with their in the very deep values. That's why I, uh, during my election campaign, I went to like 35 cities in, in my country. And I found more understanding among ordinary people using their language than talking to intellectuals who thought that they know everything, they are academicians, and they just immediately say, well, come on, what kind of bullshit are you talking about here? That's why, you know, I said I welcome any discussion which is friendly, but we should understand that in defense of capitalism, we cannot uh, call names our opponents. We should get on our side because in the first... In First argument is people react to how you talk, what you do, whether you are a good guy or not. When you, when they see that you are a good person, then they can listen to you. But if you say, "Well, how dare you not read Iron Random Mrs.? Come on, you are such a stupid person not to do that." <laughs> if you start a conversation like this, you never get involved in the intellectual crusade. Joe. No, well, I, I just want to. I just want to say, can you hear me? No. Yeah. <laughs> of course we can. Uh, this guy has never seen Cubans having an argument. <laughs> That's all. No, I, I am going to uh, not not respond right now because I do want to allow other questions. I'll try to respond to the next one. So Thank let's go know. to the next one. Next question. Gentlemen, I wanted to ask you in your opinion, uh, <coughs> Barack Obama is taking this country into socialism? With intervention in government and expanding yeah. the role of government, national uh, debt, etc. Government expenditures in the United States, all levels, uh, are forty-one point five percent. If you add eleven or thirteen percent of GDP as a regulatory burden, you end up in a Scandinavian model. So this definitely it's uh, way way higher than it was like twenty years ago. That is the way Europe poisoned America. And that's definitely the evidence of that America is going in the wrong direction. Questions? Next question. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, you handled several concepts, uh, like the reading of this uh, wonderful mm -hmm. woman that made good novels. Uh, I'm afraid that not many people will be reading them and unfortunately they'll miss all these lessons <coughs> that are very good. Uh, but on the other hand, the capitalist has been flourishing and alive like a quad market economy has been very <coughs> deep into the roots of the United States from the beginnings. And in those days people were not going to school. Most probably fifty percent of the population were literate. So how they were able to grasp what is important and keep it that way. And Europe failed 
Europe started experiments with the socialism at the beginning of the 20th century. And they are keep going on it. They, all try, they already failed several times. I think, I think that you ask for simple arguments because you cannot talk to these people that have limited education. But again, the United States had a lot of population with very little education and they were able to, to keep it in the right track until we have these days. I think that the one of the main concepts that people do grasp and understand is the concept of the sacrosanct <coughs> principle of the private property. Mm -hmm. Once you move into the, that direction, people always say, yes, this is mine. This is my car. This is my house. And this is my garden. And this is our street. And then you develop on that concept and you move on. But on the other hand, you will always have a very group, a, a small group of the population that will be willingly to give their freedom in exchange for some kind of economic support. <coughs> and this is coming from the Roman times. So well, it's always part, part of the nation. Let, let me uh, uh, comment on a, couple, on a couple of things, uh, if I may. Uh, interestingly enough, Atlas Shrug that was published, what, 34, 35 years uh -huh. ago? More. 57. More than, 1957. Last year sold half a million <coughs> copies. If you look at the Library of Congress, in the history of the United States, is the second largest selling book next to the Bible. Yeah. The Bible first, then Atlas Shrug. As a writer, you know, we're very happy we sell 2,000 books. <laughs> Atlas Shrug keeps selling. So, so it's, it's out there whether people read it or not. But to, to your point, the, the way I try to explain uh, is simply focusing on liberty, on freedom. The fact is that in the whole history of humanity, we have only invented, if you want to use that term, two ways to organize economic activity by voluntary activities, and that is represented by the market, and by coercive activities, and that is represented by government. We can argue what functions we may want to assign to government. Clean the streets, provide health care, provide education, whatever. That could be a debate. But what is not debatable is that any function that we assign to government, by definition, restricts our freedom. Yep. By definition, it's simply true. So the concept is not that hard to explain. The more government you want, the less freedom you have to willing to accept. You make the choice. That's fine. Next question. Anybody here? I like to make one other comment. I forgot to mention, I didn't hear anything about Adam Smith. Well, if you had come to the Liberty Club, <laughs> you would have. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm five minutes past all that with the Liberty Club. See, the invisible hand. Impressed. So please join me, join me in thanking our distinguished guests and our panel. <laughs> thank you for coming.